peace. Today is Wednesday the 6th, making today's math equality. Equality is to be equal in all forms of knowledge. Share your knowledge with people in your life on this day. Peace. All right, peace. Welcome back to the Anatomy. Godcast, Lord Jamal. Digger, digger. Special guest, rap royalty herself. Thank you. The one, the only, Roxanne Shante. Please believe it, baby. Uh-huh. So... All right, so yeah, you, you, you know, your career spans such a, a, a vast amount of time, but it, it's, it's a, beautiful, a beautiful time in hip-hop that you came yes. out in. Like, right. um, that whole Juice Crew experience. Like, were y'all like the first, like, really big crew? Actually, we were. As like, cause y'all was like death row or some shit back we in the day. Sure you understand were. what I'm saying? We like, sure like were. because we were the only we were the only crew that were not a collective group. Meaning, we were not the Furious Five. Right. We were not the Fantastic Four. Right. We were not. You instead, were individuals. we were we were super friends. Yes. You know, you had nice. you know you had Superman, Spider Man, oh. Aquaman, Wonder Woman. So and and, and then really together did. and then together we were like the Justice League. Like when we showed up, we showed out. Like and still today we do. If motherfuckers see motherfuckers don't really understand. My favorite crew how of all em- time too. How in power MC Shan was. Oh my goodness. When MC Shan was out. Down by law. Down, down by law. Fucking change. I mean, MC Shan was the motherfucking man. Like he was rivaling LL in a way. Like, like MC Shan. I knew mad niggas wanted to be MC Shan. Absolutely. Mad niggas wanted to be MC Shan. Uzi rap was God to but, me. But but okay, hang on. Uh, we ain't even Hold up, pump okay. your brakes. I'm sorry. Because this is, <laughs> okay, I'm a little young. This is, okay, this is go coming. Down the line. MC okay. Shan is first okay. on the list. You All see right. what I'm saying? All right. Then you got niggas from the same crew now coming up. You got niggas like Cool G Rap. Yes. Now I'm getting up on Cool G Rap on something like Rack is you won't be smiling on Rack is Allen. Okay. That's probably the first time I heard Cool G Rap. Okay. Uh, wait, did he have a demo before that? No. Nah. No, he did. And you know what the song was called? It's a demo. It's well, a that's demo. what I'm saying. I was gonna it's say, did he have it's a, a demo. demo? Yes, he did have a demo. <laughs> and straight off the bat, that shit was a hit the first time I heard it. Yep, but it Rikers good. Island, again, he mentioned the gods in, yep. in Rikers you Island. Don't be smiling on Rikers Island. Um Coogee Rap taught me how to rap. And like then, he taught me how to physically formulate a sixteen bar verse. Like that's who I study as far as then like you gonna have rhyme biz, things. you gonna have Kane, Rocks I mean Rocks Rocks I mean just, just it was crazy. Yeah. It was an overload and the fact that y'all was smart enough That's the ace Another Ma- one of my oh, Master Ace, yes. Craig, Craig G. G. Yes. The fact that y'all was smart enough, Molly Mall. The fact that y'all smart enough, Fly Ty, fucking um, Mr. What's the Magic. homie. What's the uh? Because that's the we- music. What's the uh, what's the Swan. singing dude? Oh, T J Swan. Come on, yo. The fact that y'all were smart enough to come together and say, you know what, we we kind of stronger as a collective than we are well, as little. I'm gonna tell you exactly how the Juice Crew came about. Separate pieces, please. The Juice dude. Crew came about because I was the first artist, so I was the first artist. So, you know, I knew Molly, and so I made Roxanne's Revenge. Roxanne's Revenge was such a phenomenon. It was such a hit record that. I was able to bring everyone on tour with me. Mm. And so each Juice Crew member was my DJ first. Wow. Mm. Every last one of them was my DJ first. And when they came and they were like, because they were my DJ, and they was like, listen, you know what? I rhyme. I want to do this. I want to do that. I was like, okay, cool. So then you next up. So that's where the term for us, next up, came from. Next up. I believe that's next. Me. Daddy can't get on a mic for the symphony. Now, so hang they, on, when you said they were your DJ, did they, were, were they actually DJ? Every last one was you see, my DJ. You every see how like you had one. to know like, hip hop jobs and shit. Like right. you might have been an MC, but a lot of MCs still knew how to DJ and vice versa. Like you had to know how to be a hype these man. These days, motherfuckers, come on, man, you was really educated in the business. Go and ahead. you were security. <laughs> so all of that. Hey. So what they would do is. They became my DJ first, and this allowed them to come on tour, see the type of crowds, see what they had to deal with, you know, deal with the groupies and get all that out their system. 
And then when it was time for them to make their record, because see, I've always shared the stage. I've never been selfish. So why wouldn't I want to see them next up, knowing that they're so great? So because of that, Sham was like, yo, shiny, I got this. I'm going to do that. I'm doing something. I was like, okay, fine. So come on, let's do it. So now they'll do that record. Then Shan starts to go on tour, starts to do his own shows. So now, okay, who's next up? G-Rap comes along. G-Rap comes with Polo. Mm. So now Polo can do the DJing and, you know, G-Rap is coming along because that is exactly who this group is. So now I'm on tour with Who's you rapping polo? Mm -hmm. So now they come out, they do their song. So now they have this to go. This is all by virtue of being in the same neighborhood. Basically. Of being in the same neighborhood, of, of having that connection. So then when uh, Molly said, I'm not doing this for you, not doing that for you. Biz automatically became my, Biz automatically became my beatbox. Mm. So now it's Biz's turn to make songs. He has came with them. So now he says, well, I'm getting ready to go out on tour, Shani, you know that. I said, okay, who's next up? Because I consistently toured. So now that's when I told Kane, like, yo, come on, every night you get on stage. So when he told the story on his unsung, you know, everybody was like, man, Kane was your DJ too? And I was like, yeah, everybody was. And that was just a, a not, I don't want to say call it just a rites of passage, but what it was, was it was a way of being, being able to get them out on tour, still get them some money in the meantime, and allowing them to be able to go in the studio. Because see, for me to go, I shared my studio time because the record company was willing to pay for my studio time, but I'd go in and do a freestyle. So I'm out the studio in 30 right. minutes and completed. Then the and then they got the rest of the time to do everything they want to do. So next thing you know, they already have a finished product mm -hmm. to, hang, to hand in. Right. So with the Juice Crew, that's I'm why- for your budget though. Right, but, <laughs> but the thing about it was the Juice Crew was able to say, you know what, we all came through a woman, so the birth of us is always going to continue. We're going to all be great because that is how we came here. So rather than it was a girl who joined a crew of, of you know, young men, instead it was a young lady who created a crew of her brothers and said, listen, this is what we're going to do. That's why today our bond is still so close. But everyone is their own individual star. So everyone can still go out and do tours and still go out and do shows on their own. No one needs anyone. So if we do it all together, then it's a big deal. And still drop new music because Kooji Rap last year dropped oh, yeah. the album. Phenomenal. He Master stayed. Ace is still mm. dropping stuff. Are all guys. Um, Kane. Crazy. Kane. You know, why ain't dropping no music? <laughs> you know why? Because I feel that the Roxanne Shante platform is always to expose or give that platform for those who may not be able to get that platform. So if I was to do a new album or if I was to do a musical project, it would have to consist of some artist somewhere that's so dope that's just not getting the opportunity to be heard. So I would do like a Roxanne Shante Presents. I feel like that is what I'm supposed to do. Listen to you the pot calling just, the kettle black as much people asking me, right there, okay. where's your new music? And, okay. and, that, and that's actually my same response. Like, you know what? I actually feel like I'm doing a greater service co-signing new generations of, of females. Yeah, it's like, that's like, just that's just me. You now, know? I'm surprised you only had two albums. Right. Yes? And I, let Bad me... Sister mm -hmm. and The Bitch Is Back. That's it. Yes? That's it. Tell me about those titles. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> I love it. Bully Bitches. <laughs> yeah, the Bad See, Sister. I'm telling you, I'm a direct reincarnate of her. <laughs> I feel like The Bitch Is Back probably at the time you dropped that was a little, I don't know. I think you know this. I did. Oh. I did the. Um, I did the album, the bitches back, because of you know that's what everyone had titled me. That's what so many people were saying. So it was. I felt at that time it was a way of taking the power out of the word because see, if I say it, then you need to find something else to call me. Hmm. Because now using that title doesn't bother me. Right. Saying that, not that it bothered me anyway, because I was a battle rapper, had been called bitches from day one, so it didn't bother me anyway. So because of that, I was like, okay, I'm titling my album The Bitches Back because I needed to return. So doing that return and saying The Bitches Back and then putting a single like Big Mama on it and letting them know like, okay, that's it. I'm done. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm finished. This is all I needed to do. And doing two albums 
was great for me because you figure I did two albums and have a career now that spans 35 years on just two albums where some people do 35 albums in two years and people forget about <laughs> right. it. Right, you know exactly. I mean? So I think the concept of that was, was to be able to do that. Like just thinking about how we felt about our music and our albums back then, there were no such thing as fillers. See, now a lot of artists do what they call fillers. All we want is because the record companies were pushing them to do that. All you got to do is have one or two hits and then the rest of the stuff you just throw on the album. Well, that's what helped to kill the, the the music industry, I believe. Exactly. Really? Because there was a period of time when, not to cut you off, mm -hmm. but the record company was eating high on the hog. Yes. This was all during the 90s. <clears throat> um, well, towards the mid to late 90s, where you were starting to get albums, like she said, there'd be like two or three good songs on an album mm -hmm. and the rest was filler i mean yeah bullshit filler like shit you can't listen to you gotta fast forward through the whole fucking album but yet you paying 20 fucking dollars for these cds and shit and it's just like yo i'm not gonna pay this for these three songs so now here comes the internet giving you only the songs that ring who, right. who, we don't, I don't I don't yeah ringtones ring ring right exactly yeah, ringtones help because now I only have the song that, that I, I really want to like hear, and that's it you, but hook. you fucked it up by giving us these subpar albums that only had a few songs right. if you would have gave us quality albums like they used to do back in the days the kind where you Cohesive put it in projects. and you just let it play see that's the concept and, and of you it you can't right take it out mm -hmm. if you would give deliver that the record company the, the records would still be selling see and even with the internet up. it would still be selling but, but y'all fucked it up. it up that's what messed it up because see i come from an era where you never wanted anyone to fast forward your take. Because see, if your stuff got fast forward, it was disrespectful. Exactly. Yep. So you didn't want that. So you wanted your album to be something that somebody popped in and listened to. Left it alone. The Walk whole time. Thank but you. if somebody played it and then it was like, yo, just fast forward that way. Because first of all, fast forwarding took a lot of technique because you had to fast forward, stop it just right on the beginning of the other song, fast forward and stop it again. That's just too much work. So let me just give you a good album. You just put it in and let it play. Yep. Once they started having to fast forward or either the worst thing was Flip it over to the other side. <laughs> so now you got to take that it mean, out. Now you whack. <laughs> now you really whack. Now they got to take it, flip it over to the other side. Now we got to search for something good. So that's what happened. So, you know, just I, I take a lot of pride in the fact that I only made, you know, two albums in 35 years. And because of that, I still work every weekend. You know, that that's good enough for me. So I have a question for my one of my faves. Okay. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the the movie, um, you didn't really go into like it started off with you winning the battle, but then it took a, a more personal direction. So I was curious to know why didn't you cover more of like Roxanne, the battle rapper, the you know the the Juice Crew days? Because I was looking forward to that. Like that was really like Rod Digger's life growing up as a kid. Just <laughs> we follow, wanted to see you digging somebody ass. <laughs> you right. mind you now you was chew somebody was ass sister. off. Okay, got you. You was a rap sister. I, I saw I you know I was a that would. I would say that would have been my only critique, you know, mm -hmm. from a personal standpoint. But I'm I'm just curious to know why you, you know, why you took the more personal route. Well, it was because of the fact that people are so spoiled with um, with rap stories or when they see um, a rapper's uh, biopic, they assume that it's going to be a lot of music in it. And I didn't want to portray it from an angle like, OK, everything is gold that glitters and this is what's going on, because no one really wanted to tell the story of what they dealt with behind the scenes, especially from. And I felt that from a female's perspective, it needed to be told because, sure. you know, so many of our young women are misled into thinking like, okay, well, you just rhyme in the studio, then after that you're going to have a lot of jewelry and all the guys are going to like you and you're going to be able to do this and do that. And, you know, there's so much more that takes place. So I just felt that I wanted it to be more of a movie than a long extended video of what I was able to do musically. That's what it was. I wanted it to be more of a message. And I think that we truly delivered that because of now the conversations that are sparked because of it, because I took a personal approach to it. That's that's actual factual. I mean, honestly, I, I hear that and I loved what y'all did. I still could have had a little more hip hop in it. You understand? Because you are you represent 
hip hop. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like I just wanted real. to just see a little bit of rhyming. But what you did give us was a lot of vulnerability. Yes. Now, Super. That was beautiful. What, what, first of all, inspired you to even want to tell your story, to be so vulnerable, and how did it even get to the point where we got a Netflix movie with fucking Neil Long and all kind of motherfuckers and uh, yeah, exactly. And How the everywhere. fuck did all that happen, sister? Um, well, I was approached by uh, Mimi Valdez and Nina Bon Jovi, and I was hosting an event for the African American Film Festival, and they said, "Listen, we would love to do your movie," and I'm like, "Okay," and they were like. You just saying okay, and I was like, yeah. So okay. this is not something that you were writing something no, down. No. So, so their approach this, came to you first. This That's was, interesting. This, you know what? This was just like this was just like when I made a record. You know, mm. this was like the first time when I made a record. Like I didn't go searching to make a record. Mm. You know, making a record came to me. Deep. And so I didn't go searching to make a movie. I didn't write a you know script or anything like that. I didn't say okay, I would love to tell my story or please listen to this. I want to do this. No, I didn't do that. Wow. They actually walked up to me and we had a movie in less than a year where some people take ten years to do it. Wow. Some people take no. We did it in less than a year. We only we filmed an entire movie in twenty one days inside of Queensbridge Projects and they were like, this is incredible. But because of the respect that I have for my projects and my projects has for me. And the love that I have was always given back and still participating. Nobody fucked Nobody, it up. Yeah, not, not one time. So we were able to film consistently without any breaks, without any issue. You know, and all of that is about timing. See, everything is done in divine time and things that happen when they're supposed to happen. And that's just the way I live. I live, you know, at the with the thought that things happen that are supposed to happen when they are supposed to happen. I don't rush anything, you know, nor do I go searching for anything because what you're supposed to have will find you. So even with the movie, I didn't go searching for the movie. They came to me and approached me about it. And I said, okay, fine. They said, listen, let's have breakfast tomorrow. I said, cool, here's my number, call me. We actually had breakfast the next day. And then we had writers and everything within three months. We were sitting there, you know, and when I say that we had writers, um, Michael, Michael Larnell, who we used to, who's the director and the writer, I told him my story and he was like, that's it. That's all I needed. So I told him the story over a series of just meeting three times and told him my story. Like, listen, this part, this part, this part. And what we used was we made sure that the main line of the story was all organically able to be backed up with a 30 year visual, meaning the same scene with Marley in the movie. I have that on videotape. So that's why a week after we released it on Netflix, mm. we also released 30 year videotape of him saying those exact things I out of saw, his mouth. I saw that. The same thing we did, the same thing we did with my mom saying those things. Then we did the videotape with my mom wow. saying those same exact things. And that was to, you know, so that people didn't think things were made up or people didn't think that this automatically became this dramatic effect right. for the biopic. Like, oh, she didn't really do that during the laundry. So I let him say that. And then also with the Nas part in the movie, you know, Nas told that in his documentary. I saw so it. it wasn't like these were things that Roxanne Shantae came out and said about herself. One thing about me is I'm extremely humble. That part and was heartwarming too. Like, <laughs> it was real heartwarming. Nice. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and so because of that, you know, Roxanne Shantae is, is very humble. And when, when you're very good at the things that you do or when you're already blessed enough to be able to take care of your family and take care of others and then the things that you've done for others, you see them be able to take care of their families. Right. You don't go around and just say, oh yeah, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. You know, you just sit back, you take a humble seat you eat a humble plate and you're good. Talk you about know? birthing niggas. This you girl whipped nasty nice into shape, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Okay, threaten to whoop his ass. You know, so. right? Well, listen. When we come back, we're gonna have, we're gonna talk more with our special guest, rap royalty Roxanne Shante. Because I want to know how you feel about females today. Mm. Okay. Good question.
space. It's the absence of all confusion. United we stand, divided we fall. Two fingers together is the real peace sign, y'all. Brand Nubian peace gear. Hoodies. T-shirts. Snapbacks. Available at hoodchee.com. Get yours today.